Hello, good morning, and welcome to another episode of What Do We Do Now? A conversation about the live event industry. This morning, I'm really excited to be joined by Ian Lamb. Lammy, say hello. Hello. Hello from North Devon, everybody. How are you today? Great to talk to you. I'm all right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the uh, um, more sleep last night, actually, because the, uh, the weather... I haven't taken a turn for the worse. The dawn chorus didn't start with such gusto this morning at 5.30. Oof, wow, that's an early start. Do you normally get up <laughs> at that sort of time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we managed to uh, yeah, managed to sleep through that. When the sun's out, when it's a, a sunny day, the birds are out really early and it's, uh, yes, jackdaws outside the window. But we wow, have it. Sort of. Sounds idyllic. Um, yes. So let's jump into it. it. How? Um, yeah. Tell us about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? And how did you get your start in the live events industry? Okay. So uh, I now, for those people that I, uh, don't know me, I've uh, worked with, but uh, I'm a stage manager, uh, freelance uh, event um, stage manager. Uh, but I began way back and interested in theatre when I was at school and did acting at school, but then uh, progressed on to doing stage management and technical theatre and scenic carpentry at Lambda, Drama School Lambda in London, mm -hmm. where I graduated mm -hmm. in 84, um, did a brief time in repertory uh, theatre, and then friends from Lambda that had uh, a lot of ended up um, going uh, either full-time or freelance with Imagination, uh, agency imagination uh they were earning like as much in a day as i was earning a week at rep and um <laughs> uh and they uh they said well do you want to come and do some stage management with imagination so i started doing that um but then i rapidly uh changed direction as we can do sometimes if we choose to in this fab business we work in um ended up being a, a carpenter on a lighting crew on a massive installation three month installation for imagination um but there wasn't much country to do um i remember saying to the chief electrician i knew that i was amongst legends i could just feel the these this team that i was on i was really young i was 20 20 21 i guess and uh and i said i'm a bit of a waste of space here i've been doing carpentry for you guys but i do you know i'd understand if you wanted to get somebody else another electrician instead of me but um i love climbing um you kind of tell me what to do what you want doing and i'll do the climbing and they were all like yeah brilliant yeah i love that so did that and uh and so what were you climbing up to do job, just just tell me a little bit more about that what were you actually that, climbing that venue was a space frame uh, so we, uh, we were putting, um, bars, the reading team were putting, um, scaff bars, uh, in the space frame. And then this was all before moving headlights, uh, which were 1985. So, uh, this is all park hands and, uh, Fresnels and, uh, floods. And so we were going up and rigging all that cabling and everything moving through the space frame. So you couldn't fly anything up. There was, there was hardly any chain hoist involved in it because you had to have maximum height with the bars inside the space frame. So there's a lot of scrabbling, swinging about and climbing. Um, and then uh, the riggers at Unusual Rigging that were there, they asked if I was uh, if I did rigging, which I went, no. And they said, would you like to? And I was like, yeah. And, uh, and so they gave me a, a start in that as well. So then I had from 85 to 95, um, doing lighting and uh, lighting and rigging. Put my stage management, took my stage management hat off, did that. And then I eventually came back into doing stage management. A bit of a roundabout journey, but what we can do in this business. Yeah, absolutely. So some stage management, some some carpentry, some rigging, kind of quite a, a few different disciplines there. As you kind yeah. of look back across your working life, like what um, what was your favorite job and why? Um, I think uh, I shared cookies things he said the other day on his talk is that it's really hard to pinpoint pinpoint uh, single jobs because I kind of enjoyed just about every job that I've done, even the hard knock ones, you know, I mean, there's, there's always something out uh, in it and the, the team and everything, mm -hmm. but choosing something, I think as a, as a lampy, uh, I think it would have to be working on, I think probably about seven of the Royal tournaments in, uh, wow. in the old mm -hmm. Earl's court building. Uh, and sometimes I would do uh, the rigging installation and then move on to the lighting team to, to do the focus, help with the focus. Um, that was always a great job. And then as a rigger, I think if I pinpoint something, then it would be working on the Gladiators TV uh, series, which we're doing in front of a live audience. Three summers, I think I did of that. 
And that was amazing. Massive amounts of How rigging cool. at Mother Grid, great team, big team, all into department, fun and, and hard work. It was. That, and that if was you were really into climbing, job. then presumably that is in your element there with all of that oh, uh, totally. gladiator stuff to climb on. We did. And well, in fact, because uh, every year, I mean, we're talking about in days when, you know, health and safety was much different then than it is now. It was much more more down to you know, um, common sense. There was no real governing body over it. It was we worked for the rigging company and it's yeah, uh, yeah we just act with common sense and uh, and working with these uh, legendary riggers as well that guided us when we were really young um so some years you know that the truck would arrive the doors would open and some game would which kimpton walker and may would come off the back of this truck and we're like scratch our heads well what is it and it's like well this is a pole and then these things go up and then this flies in and you press a button and it goes in will you test it so we would wow. go and test these games so we did all the uh the kind of that skeletrics thing of running the figure of eight game and the climbing wall we'd be laid on the climbing walls we did um uh, uh, yeah, every every game that was on there, we we tested out and um, played with. So it was great. It was amazing time. <laughs> amazing That's time. That's incredible. And then you kind and of stage so you move back into stage management again. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so eventually, this long sort of like windy road round and a, uh, a break in the middle after having a um, an accident where I got knocked over and I couldn't work in the business for quite a while. And then eventually came back into stage management. Uh, which was fantastic. And I was really nervous about that. And for, for various reasons, um, for health reasons, and for, for just like, you know, who am I coming back into this? Mm. But I hadn't kind of forgotten anything. And I always kind of still thought as a stage manager, it's kind of ingrained in me, even when I was rigging the lighting. So I got really back into it. And I think the, to pinpoint two shows, which kind of very much encompass what I love about stage management would have been the, uh, the Queen's Diamond Jubilee celebrations at Windsor. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then in 2016, uh, working on the Queen's 90th birthday celebrations on the main stage. Uh, the first one with Tracy wow. Jakes and then uh, the second on stage. And then the second one, I was just stage manager on my, my own on the main stage. Yeah, yeah. And so just tell me a little bit for people that don't necessarily know the ins and outs of stage management, like what is it that you're actually doing in that in that kind of role? Okay, um, I I sometimes uh, I I, I taught on a couple of occasions as well at drama school on this and I kind of honed it down to basically my feeling about about stage management is whoever I mean, on that job was looking after orchestra, um, uh, celebrity acts, uh, singers, dancers, uh, choirs, all manner of things, and narrators, and it's and it doesn't matter how professional they are, or how much you think they're they experience. It's like it's mm-hmm. the same with uh, conference as well. Is that person that's going on to stage, or those people that are going on stage? I see uh, my job, stage management team's job, make sure that they can walk on stage and do their thing, knowing that they don't have to worry about anything that's going on behind them that they can go on with as much confidence as they can feel and try and make them feel comfortable try and Mm. ascertain try and almost second guess study them almost and find out what what you think makes uh, is making them nervous and attend to that and try and do that before they've even flagged it up so that they go on there and they do their thing and you're just in the background making sure that everything's everything's happening and their happiness their welfare the orchestra making sure that the orchestra They've got mm. tea, coffee, snacks. They've got uh, a loo nearby, making sure that they've got what they need as well. It's looking after people. And so just, you know, one of the things um, I wanted to talk with you about in particular today is mental health. I think there's an awful lot mm. of people going through, uh, you know, a massive change at the moment, especially uh, in, in in the live events industry. Um, and there's something in that role there, that stage management role, where you're fundamentally just trying to prepare people to go out and give their absolute best in front of, in front of people. Mm. And that kind of really finely tuned um, empathy that you've just described and, and the way that you just look after them and make sure that they're okay. But, but what about you? Like, how are you doing? And, and uh, what are you feeling? And like, how does that, how, how has that come about? There's, there's, there's something there, isn't there? Where, um, yeah. yeah, I don't know if you know what I'm trying to say, there's, but like yeah, the empathy really and question. looking out for others, but you're not really looking after yourself, right? Or we're not yeah. as an industry, we're often not really looking after ourselves. And in mental in mental health terms, which uh, which as you know, as a lot of people out there know, I've got a great deal of interest in and and, and a lot of personal personal experience in. 
um, and I'm always keen to share about is that I think you, you do have to look after number one because you can't be anything for anybody else unless you unless you look after yourself. It has to start there, yeah. uh, not in a selfish way, just just keeping yourself stable. And I have lost track of that many many times in my life, and that's partly to do with something that we'll, we'll talk about um, uh, later. But um, I think fundamentally, I think it is kind of in me, part of my upbringing. My parents are incredibly loving, came from a great, great home and was really uh, encouraged to care about things, animals, people. Um, mm. And then I think something that I, I have in, in sort of stage management, this might sound silly to some people, but uh, I love being in the Scouts when I was in the Cubs and Scouts when I was a kid. And there's part yeah. of the motto in that, which is think of others before yourself and do a good turn every day. And I think that does in the way that I do stage management anyway that's the way that I work it's it's like I um I want to make sure I, I, I empathize it's like compassion and empathy and uh and caring I mean it sounds saintly but I'm I'm no saint as many of my old mates will know from uh uh period one calls the fabulous drinking years and beyond but uh um and always that fun and humor I think is really important well-placed humor um, or off-ball humour, and I think within within the teams backstage, it's not just it's not just about the people that are going onto stage. As stage managers, we're roaming, we're roaming around backstage. Some of some of those technical guys, as we all know, are rooted from the moment they've done the fit up or when they've arrived on site, they're rooted to the spot in front of control systems, and. God, I can't imagine doing that. My brain, my fizzy, fizzy brain wouldn't be able to cope with it to start with. I wouldn't be able to concentrate long enough. But it's about empathising with them as well and caring for them. Fetch somebody a bottle of water. Fetch somebody a snack. See if they're okay. Can I do anything? Can I cover for you? Just da-da-da-da. Whatever. Yeah. Trying to make that easy as well. So all of those people are yeah. as important as the people on stage. I think that's why I love stage management so much. And in fact, in rigging and lighting as well, it was always sort of being aware of all these other departments and now in stage yeah. management, knowing of all that about lighting and rigging and stuff and learning if, every time we go on to, uh, on to site, we learn something, we pick something up. Yeah. So yeah, empathy, yeah. And so, empathy, compassion, yeah. kindness, I think. Yeah. And I think that constant giving of yourself, though, I suppose, is one of the things that um, that uh -huh. kind of starts to take its toll on you. I mean, if we just reflect for the moment on the last kind of, kind of 12 weeks now um how is your mental health how have you found um how do you feel right now as you kind of look back on the last 12 weeks and and you know what what's happened for you like you know when did it hit you that things are going to change is the question i've been asking but um yeah yeah talk me through that uh yeah it, I, I think i realized on the last job i did in the final week of february when i was up in london doing a job and saw what was going on in the city and and mm. it was like whoa this 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 and obviously seeing what was on on the news but but it was like the the reality of being amongst a lot of people and realizing the the seriousness of this and then in the, at the beginning of march i had the first job cancellation and it was like whoa okay this this is happening and then it just during march i'm sure for for like everybody march i'm just referring to as dominoes it was just like bam 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 um oh, right yeah. the way through this year i mean everything out of the diary and to the point where you know a job that was then postponed to september and you think oh, maybe you know maybe 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 but no now that's postponed to next may so yeah. it is wow. what's going to happen strangely i was almost less financially obviously it is a problem i'm a, a limited uh now as a limited company because I, i've decided to tow that hmrc line and what a lot of agencies now prefer um but because i'm uh the director of you know it's just me but i'm not on payroll so i fall into that weird gray area where there's just there's just no uh money coming there's no support there and there's no money coming no in support and, there no um, no it's a bit of savings which luckily we had some uh, um uh, and in but, terms of the, um, the feeling, like what 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 feeling does that evoke in you? Do you see what I mean? Can you name that? Like, can you anxiety. name your response to that? Yeah, anxiety. Um, yeah. I think weirdly slightly less anxious than if if this was if there was nothing going wrong in the world, and I didn't have these jobs. I wonder what I'd done wrong. 
and like yeah. oh my god i've been a real panic then about have i really lost my you know lost my my place in this in this working world that mm. we work in so in some ways because mm. it's all out of our control and there's nothing we can do about it that gives a certain okay okay so just try and stay calm about that and yeah. stay calm with anxiety um, and were you able uh, to jump straight there, like, or as that kind of anxi anxiety crept up, or, or did it hit you, like, that kind of fearfulness, like, over what sort of period of time do you think is that kind of did it stick with you, March into April, or did you recognise it quite yeah. quickly as as your response? Yes, I think it was it was through throughout March and then into April, and it was mm. um, uh, I have a great relationship with my wife and I, a very open relationship in talking about. Uh, where we're at in our heads sometimes mm. quite often um uh i'll keep mine stum because i don't want to you know i don't want to add burden onto her and then and then jenny will say Look, no tell me talk to me about talk to me about it and she just noticed that there were certain um erratic behaviors and doors locking and non-communication yeah. that i was doing yeah. so thankfully for me she brought that up and at first she's like no 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 I, no 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 i'm fine i'm fine but but actually, yeah, okay, yeah, I see where you're coming from. I am. I am closing those doors. and I'm pushing away the people that I love. It's like, I'm in this, I'm in this. What am I going to do with it? And so that was, that was a great key to actually going back into some tools that I've had throughout um, using life, like mindfulness, uh, to, yeah. to actually just stop for a moment. And uh, I just did it then. I just stopped for a moment, looked beyond the computer at a tree outside. Um, just to, to try and focus my mind on something that's not worrying about what's going to happen or not happen. Yeah, yeah. Way. So let's just let's take a moment just to talk about, I guess, that toolbox. But before we go into yeah. the details of, of the tools in the box, um, in terms of what works works for you, and this is obviously a very personal thing. So we're kind of, you know, this isn't any, we're, neither of us are professionals. We're just talking about no. your experience of how you deal with this. But yeah. I suppose let's go back a little bit and talk about um, one of your earlier experiences. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Was it in, you were 22 or 23 at the time? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, tell me about a, what happened. To, and... to um, uh, many people that wouldn't know about this is that, um, I'll, I'll do this really quickly, but I've, I've had mental health issues since I was 13, uh, which is when I first noticed these these monumental highs followed by absolute crashing lows and, and pushing mm. things away and not knowing how to deal with that. Um, and then, uh, and at the time, there was far more stigma around, we're talking the 80s, um, yeah. so late 70s, actually, late 70s and then into the 80s, there was far more stigma about mental health issues. Um, didn't really want to bother anybody with that. I just thought I'd deal with this myself. I didn't know what it was, but it's just obviously something that you're going through as a kid. But I've since discovered that that um, I, I do suffer and will for, for the rest of my life, I suffer from clinical depression. Um, and there's a difference. There's a there's a sort of scientific, uh, psychological difference in uh, anxiety and depression. And the clinical depression, basically, my clinical depression as as how it works, which I've discovered through conversations with doctors and uh, and therapists and health groups, is we all produce serotonin in our brains. We produce it in our guts. We produce it in our brains, and it, it's what helps keep our bodies going. The serotonin is known as uh, the happy. It's not a happy drug. It's it's like that that um, uh, uh, the happy, happy molecule hormone or something. Or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's what it's what gives us a certain lightness, a certain happiness in our bearing. And the two don't mm. match. What if you've got plenty going on down here? It can't get through to the brain. It's what you're doing in the brain. And if you're naturally, if your brain is naturally not producing that serotonin, um, then you are liable to bouts of, of serious depression. You can you know, yeah, get yeah. it naturally helpful from light. I very rarely ever wear sunglasses because it's just you can get it from uh, natural light, which in our mm -hmm. business, as we know, we mostly work in the dark and very rarely get out for yeah. you know more than 10 minutes to get any natural light. So that's a, something for people to be aware yeah. of. But I just point out that I'm not professional. I have had um, uh, some training in Gestalt therapy for uh, part time for a year because out of personal interest and wondered if that's where I wanted to go in a career. Mm. Um, but I really do like to share the experiences that I've got because I've learned so much about this, and I hope that you know some of it will be of help to um, to other people into understanding what makes yeah. us tick. Yeah, yeah. So sorry, I went off on tangent. So so that went um, through. Um, 
drama school, uh, age 18 to 20, was fairly okay because so I was so busy all the time. The adrenaline was just push, push, push. And then 20, took a real plummet in, uh, in depression. I think it was like the next stage of life, um, whatever was going on in my brain, I didn't know about this serotonin issue at that point. There's nobody really to talk to. It was just all sort of like, you know, pull yourself together, shake yourself up. Um, but I was uh, yeah. self-harming. Uh, keeping it hidden underneath, um, wearing sweatshirts on hot days, and everybody being in, in t-shirts. I and mean, what are you wearing that for? I'm like, oh, no, just, 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 you know, feel cold. Um, and and so secret, secret, secret. And the more that you're keeping it secret, the harder a pressure it is that's sort of pushing down on your head. I had a great fun life at that time. It was mad. It was absolutely mad. It was full of fun and everything. So in some ways, what happened next doesn't really make a lot of sense. But it's just the way that the brain does work and the way that you are just masking things and pushing through and pushing and hiding and hiding and pushing and pushing. And in the end, something just went pop when I was 23 and I attempted suicide um, by cutting my wrist. Um, that obviously, thank God I survived it. I wasn't very good at it, fortunately. Um, uh, and that was a, a monumental change in life and in mindset as to what exactly is going on um wow that's that incredible that to means? hear about kind of i guess where you're coming from a little bit there with that and um am i right in thinking that you kind of became known as as having done that as well like you know we have such strong bonds with people and you yeah know, such a tight-knit community across the industry but you kind of then as well as having gone through that in the first place you then became known as as a person that had been through that like what was that like yeah that was that was interesting it was um uh following on from that that episode and and physically i i, I healed and i was waiting for a, a, an appointment for um mm. uh, to see a psychiatrist um and then i was told when i went to the hospital to find out what was going on bear in mind this is time before internet this is um before mobile phones um mm. uh, and i was told i got eight month wait before seeing a psychiatrist i'm like Wow. Is it on my notes what I've done? And they're like, yes, yes, but I'm sorry, that's all we can do. And it's, and it's okay. That's incredible. And it actually, that is incredible. Fortunately, I have this, you know, sometimes warped sense of humor and, and it made me laugh. And I was like, oh my God. So I'm just going to do this myself. I had seen my doctor as well, my GP at the time, who just looked at me and just went, it was pull this was after the, the act. And he said, you just got to pull yourself together. And, and take, take this prescription, take these pills, which were in those days, it was only 1988 when the medication as we know it now is, is fairly um, uh, serotonin um, enhancing medication, um, the much safer medication came into being. So prior to 88, you were given something where the side effects, um, tricyclic, I think is called the medication, and, uh, and a major uh, side effect of that was um uh, was just would just suppress things and would just knock you out and so i refused to take it i thought i if, if i've got the power to get through this i will do it now at mm. that time a lot of real good friends those who knew um, or were near me or with me in the few days after uh, that i'd attempted suicide were mm. just so such good friends it was it shocked them to bits it uh this one friend said i should have seen that coming um, uh, and I'm really sorry. It's just not your fault. And uh, um, and they covered up for me. And there was things. There was people sort of maybe talk about things. And uh, and they were like, no, no, no. There's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then I realised because I was full, I felt ashamed. I felt um, I felt I despised myself. It was like what what am I doing? Where am I going? It's like you know, really young. Uh, what have I just thrown? What mm. I just tried to throw away here? And it was like, and the fact that I appreciated what these friends were doing, but all that was going to do was actually make me go deeper back into myself again, and it wasn't going to sort it out. Mm. So I figured, well, mm. uh, and I knew at this point because of the friends that some of the friends that I've met in the first uh, year in in um, year or two year three years in in um, uh, in freelance world that some of us kind of identify with each other it was almost like a secret society and then we would get into conversations in pubs or meet up and sort of chat about mental health issues um which kind of wasn't done then it's not that long ago but it, it, it just wasn't done 
So I mean, there's an awful lot of that that's not done right now. Do you know what I mean? Well, I that, no. We're part it's, of the reason we wanted to do this conversation is to try yeah. and talk about it. I mean, I'm I was terrified coming into this because I don't know how to talk about nice. it. Um, and yeah. it's really uh, incredible, really, to hear you um, talk so openly about what you've been through um, and and how that's kind of affected you. Um, just to kind of go back to, I suppose, the toolbox that we started to yeah. talk about, like. Um, uh, just tell me a little bit more about, I guess, some of those tools that you use that work for you. Okay. Uh, way back then, it was it was early days. There was nothing. It was you know what books I could get out of the library, but I had difficulty concentrate on them, and it was like uh, it was madness of like, okay, I'm reading that, but does that apply to me? And and there was no training. I didn't even consider mm. therapy. I didn't know anything about therapy. I thought you went to hospital mm. and you got therapy. Um, and I was scared as well because I thought if I'm going to see a psychiatrist, uh, I'd heard about electric shock th- uh, treatment. Am I going to get that? Am I insane? I mean, it's what 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 is this about? So it was about trying to reel in and and keep calm. Um, I stepped into trying to have as much of a fun life as I as I could, and that seemed to work. And laugh a lot, and that seemed to work. That seemed to sort of be and and very aware from early days when I was 13, 14, 15, of this manic high meteoric low, which we've spoken about before in the, is what we often yeah, get I, on I think the site. I, yeah, I was going to say, I think it's worth, let's just talk about some of the cycle of the nature of these projects that we work on. I mean, you know, I mm. am a production manager, like I've said, I, I love delivering shows, but there is definitely a cycle to those shows. You know, um, I guess we do different roles, but I would often be, you know, planning for, you know, often over a six month period. Um, and then, you know, maybe kind of three or four weeks out, the kind of intensity level increases as we get nearer to the actual point of delivery. You know, they're having so many more conversations, dealing with so many more people as you, as all the different elements of the team start coming sort of online. Um, and then as you go into the show, my experience of it is, you know, I never, never sleep um, the night before a load in just never like my brain goes into overdrive just absolutely spins round and round and round ticking over everything and then you know you get into the build and that is for me the absolute thrill is being asked Mm. a million questions a day by you know all kinds of different people trying to solve all sorts of different problems um and then you know getting into the show and and through the d-rig and then my experience afterwards is is just crashing out of it like i have some Mm. some kind of adrenaline high um that i've become addicted to which is why i love what i do um and i'm not sure that's entirely healthy um but yeah just tell me a little bit about i guess do you resonate with some of that or how how does that that work for you yeah big time i mean what you say about about that that the sleep of of um uh, uh of of you're not getting it when you most need it and the brain is mm. like and the brain's mm. as we talked about before like there's a zing 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 all those things going around in your head mm. and it's crazy and you know that you identify with it but mm. unable to do something with it because it's almost like the the brain is not allowing it's 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 um uh it's it's viewing what is the most important thing to think about all these things and and, and put them yeah, in a line yeah yeah and, I and think so you mentioned that, about mindfulness i guess as as one yes. of the ways of trying to interrupt one of those tools that you use to interrupt yeah. that that, that yeah, cycle that, that process on on the sleep side of things something that it doesn't work for everything everybody and i think it is all about trying different things and finding what works for you never give up never give up some things out there and you can actually own it and sort of pat yourself on the back about it when you're doing it but i think one of the sleep thing that i I've, I've shared with quite a few people when um uh, having done a mindfulness group therapy course um right uh as a client um and uh is is in the sleep thing is just thinking about one word um uh and mine is thinking mine's my word is thinking uh, as so thinking <laughs> you think so you actively thinking. think about the word thinking the word thinking. okay tell me yeah. more that's and cool. uh, i swap it sometimes my, my current one is thinking and right. uh and it could be sleeping it could be usually but, usually, but what do you do with that word something that ends in that. ing or, sorry so what do you so, do with that then? So when you say you think about it, like what do you mean? You, you like you visualize the letters or you've got like, all these you things do? going on in your head, all these thoughts, bam, 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 bam. And it's just mm. bring one word into playing, it it into play into your head. And it works best, I find, if it's a gentle word. And usually the mm. ing 
is is nice because it's it ends on a slight high and it just it just seems to work and everybody I've spoken with about this and recommended it to um, seem to adopt the same thing and so if you're thinking of one word you can't be thinking about anything else and so effectively it's a form of thinking med- meditation so you think thing if you're on your own and you can do it so you can whisper it or you can say it out loud even better because your brain is putting everything into actually doing that speech of that mm-hmm. word um can be a bit weird for a partner if you're uh, if you're with somebody so then you <laughs> going just around think, whispering think the word over and over yeah, yeah. whisper the word this is purely about going to sleep and then if those thoughts charge in and go like no but no but the, the rigging of that and the da, 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 and the set of that when's that going to be mm-hmm. done it's like don't beat yourself up about it just go okay yeah all right i've got that fine push that to one side back to my word and the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful part about this, I, I, I absolutely adore it when it when it works. And other people have, have fed back that it's worked for them. They come into work next day and go, oh, my God, I did get it. Is you're not even aware of going to sleep. And then you just drift off to sleep. And then when you wake up, be it one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever, later, you've been responsible for helping yourself get to sleep. And you wake up more refreshed. Those zing zing thoughts come back in, but you've got more of a refreshed time. This is, again is layman's... And almost that ownership just... of that process actually is mm. what you're saying. Also, then helps you. So the fact that you've worked, you take a moment to celebrate that. Yeah. During the, the following morning, and and yeah. then that kind of is its own kind of encouragement. Um, the other thing yeah. you spoke about a little bit there was was mindfulness. Just um, I yes. actually use the Headspace app, so I I do kind of really? a bit of mindfulness that I find helps me. Um, just to kind of stay on the level, just to try and get out of those kind of boom and bust cycles across shows. Um. But yeah, tell me a little bit about mindfulness and just you know what that is and how. Yeah, you uh, mindfulness. I, I got into. I went into this. This was uh, another uh, piece, just because after because of clinical depression, um, just because I had uh, um, done that act of attempted suicide. That doesn't necessarily mean when people suffer clinically with depression that you can still come into a bad space where that thought comes back into your head. Um, in some ways, because I have gone that whole way, I know my barrier i know where i'm going i'm kind of help within myself but i have been an incredibly depressed when uh, during a particularly bad period um and i thought of this actually this this morning this uh as as an example of anxiety um uh, what's anxiety what's depression depression when you completely overcome and it can be in increments but if it's if it's over uh, days and weeks of constantly just low constantly sad about everything nothing can cheer you up nothing nothing can get in there and your brain doesn't allow anything in there and there was a there was a thing when my wife and i used to own a a small gift shop during a period when i was out of this business during after uh, being knocked over um and i had a particularly bad period of depression i mean one of one of the worst and there was a on the carpet at the back of the shop there was a thread that had come loose and every day and i used to glue it down and then it would come up and it got to the point in this cycle of depression where I could not go to the back of that shop because as soon as I saw that loose thread, I tried trimming it, another thread come back, gluing it in. Every time I saw that loose thread, within 15 seconds, my brain had gone a process from loose thread right through all of the knock-on effects of that to bankruptcy, losing the house, losing my wife, everything. Every time I saw it, I could not go there. And that was a trigger. And, um, Jenny uh, had, had noticed sort of like how I was spiraling. I used to be very good at acting, covering covering that up, but then there comes a point where you can't. Um, and so I went to the doctor and uh, I had been on, um, I can never remember the word of it, uh, the um, the new medication um, prior right. to that. Uh, had I, was she? No, no, I hadn't. That was what made me go on to that medication. Um, to help boost the serotonin. But I also, um, uh, about six months later, went and asked, I said, I, I, I want some therapy. I want to try a new therapy, a gestalt therapy uh, beforehand. Um, and I really fancy stepping way out of my comfort zone and going for group therapy. Is it, But we haven't got much money. Is there anything that you can re- recommend? Is there anything on the NHS? And there was at that time. There was a mindfulness group therapy. God, I was so nervous about this. <coughs> So I was in a group with about, I think, 10 other people. And mindfulness, for those of you who don't 
know about it. I swear by this. I use it at work now. I use it at, at home now, even in tiny little amounts. But um, the, your first session uh, is you're, you're given um, a current. You close your eyes and you hold your hand out and you're just given a current in your hand. Like and a, it's all about... Like a little berry it. current. I mean, literally a, a berry. little berry current. Yeah, yeah, yeah. not a live yeah. current, not, uh, not electrician's <laughs> current. <laughs> and uh, a little berry current. And, uh, and you just ask to feel it. And something that, uh, that I know I, I have here a prop. So if you can do this, like, do it at home. You don't need currents. Just whatever you're doing, if you feel yourself, you're going, you've got feeling anxiety, you can't control it, you don't know what's going to happen. Whatever you're doing, pick up, uh, I don't know if that's on camera, yes. So pick yeah. up your mug. So I've got a, a mug of tea. And so uh, I prefer to close my eyes if I'm doing it before I'm not walking down the street. Uh, and then I hold that and I can feel the weight of it. And it's being totally at one with that item that I'm holding. And I can but feel what does that mean? This, like, yeah, just tip. talk me through what that means when you say at one. So you're holding it and what's going through your mind? You're, you're sort of asking yourself questions about it? It's it's feeling it and what it's and what what it's actually giving. So that chip on the yeah. on the side of it, I'm thinking like, I can feel that. I can feel the texture of it. I can feel where it's broken away. And then that reminds me of that fact that that was the memory when I knocked it off the drainer shelf and it fell into the mm. sink and a bit of that chipped off. I can feel this handle. This mug was given to me as a present. So I'm thinking about when was that and and um, where was that. So it's actually concentrating all of what i'm touching and feeling and the heat of it so as well using your senses kind of engaging I'm your using senses my in a senses. specific way yeah yeah instead of thinking about what i was ang feeling anxiety about so it's mm. just bringing it back and, and doing things i posted something up on facebook in in march um about a mental health awareness um strap and it was just this very thing that if you're if you're feeling um, full of anxiety about what's what's happening at the moment, um, that and every, and it's perfectly natural to do so. Don't beat yourself up about mm. it. Is if we're very fortunate, we've got woodlands near us, uh, but you can do it in the garden, you do it wherever on the street if you live in in city. Is just being aware and and being conscious of your senses, actually listening to that bird call or actually listening to those cars going by. Can I identify what that car is? Is that a bus? Is that a, is that a refuse mm. truck? What is that? In, for us, in woods, beautiful. And go and just sort of like hold the, feel the lichen on the, or lichen on the, on the tree, the texture of it. What, what put that there? How did that happen? The air is really good air to, to, to be able to do that. It's healthy. Um, and again, so it's a very to birds. physical oh. sort of a very physical analysis, if you see what I mean, or a very conscious yes. physicality of what you're going through. So it's like, like, you know, grounding yourself in, in your environment or something like is kind of what yeah. you're describing there. Yeah, it is. It sounds very hippy trippy, you know, hippy dippy um, sort of thing. But this um, and and it and it doesn't appeal to a lot of people for that in the in the mindfulness group that I was in, um, which on that level because of the anxiety this was a mindfulness group particularly for people um, suffering clinical depression um mm. we were all targeted in that in that way and we talked about your mind going into a downward spiral and when it's on that downward spiral you you're on it it's like riding a roller coaster and it's difficult to get off that um and so you want it to be on an upward spiral which is where halting it by taking the thoughts out of something else into something physical um, is such, and there was there was some guys on there. See, men's mental health we know is 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 renowned for being uh, uh, men. The suicide levels in men are much higher. I think what Prince William's doing at the moment with the with the footballers is fantastic. He's yeah. chosen yeah, a yeah. brilliant platform to actually put that across. Um, mm. And and so just sharing this with with people is that thing. Which again, is something I posted on Facebook a few weeks ago was. Um, as you said, you're nervous about doing this, uh, a little bit nervous about doing this mental health um, yeah. talk, is finding the courage. If you spot somebody or you haven't heard from somebody for ages and just phone them up saying, how are you doing? And, you know, you can talk to me completely openly if you want to. People mm -hmm. aren't necessarily going to immediately open up. Go, oh, my God, I'm really suffering, blah, blah, blah. But just mm -hmm. if they are in a bad place... And if they are really suffering, even if they don't want to uh, admit it or haven't quite admit it themselves, just that mm. that contact, just that asking could actually slow down that downward spiral 
or actually reaching through it or they're reaching out of it and thinking about something else. For people who are living yeah. on their own at the yeah. moment and locked in, particularly in cities, I think, mm. having lived in London for years, I know what that's like. It, it must be so much to cope with. Yeah. And suddenly, yeah, yeah. you know, in our business, okay. suddenly a job that we love doing where we go out and we do these mad things, as you said, about the adrenaline. We've got that massive adrenaline rush and that feeling, even if bits of the show go wrong, that feeling of, of like, my God, we've just achieved that. And then that's just stopped. And in a, in a way, yeah. perhaps for a lot of us, the job that we do is a, is a form of escape almost because it is totally absorbing. It's totally yeah. engulfs you and envelops you in what it mm. needs to get there. Yeah, there's, there's so possibly I, like an, an element of mindfulness about, I think sometimes when I think about what, what the, what people that are actually operating equipment are doing, you know, but they yeah. get into that sort of zone, which is a little bit more totally connected to whatever it is that they're doing. Um, yeah. Rather than, yeah. Rather than having their minds spinning around. Like Absolutely. Different I think technicians like, like are brilliant like that because they, they have that power of concentration to concentrate fully. Mm. Um, and then they've got, you know, obviously there's the, there's the, uh, the negative side effects of, of, of the, the lack of sleep, the long hours and the sort of like bit that, that constant focus of concentration, and the lack of daylight, like you think, going on. just that yeah. actual physicality, really the, the well, physiology of that. The physiology. Yeah. Yeah. And I really think at this moment as well, it's like, I mean, rock and rolling, I never really did that much rock and roll as, uh, as rigor or, or lampy. Um, but I think, I think about people that are, are basically spend their lives out on the road going from tour to tour to tour to mm. tour within that kind of real family unit of living mm. on the coach together, living in hotels and done and always, always together, always producing. What that must be like to suddenly stop and no longer be a rover, no longer being being doing that. It, it mm. it's got to be you know something just to be aware of. Of yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. love. I don't want to be a downer on everybody yeah. about this. All I'm trying to say is sort of like be in tune. Try and be in tune to yourself, and and try not to beat yourself up about feeling low because it is a perfectly natural feeling in that in yeah. that respect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think so. And, so and, kind of what you're saying is through this, as people are. Are coming to terms, I suppose, with what's going on. They they may be reacting in unexpected ways. There may be things that they're not used to. Like you say, if you go from job to job to job, um, and you're suddenly not doing that anymore, there's there's quite a lot that could be changing in your psychology. And when I kind of was thinking about this conversation, I wanted to title this, you know, the kind of this episode, you know, what do we do now to protect our psychology? Um, but I think. Uh, the stigma of the term mental health mm. was actually just yeah. putting me off calling, yeah. calling it what it yeah. is. Like, um, yeah. you know, what's your take on that? Like, you know, we need to protect ourselves. We need to look after ourselves, but part of that is yeah. we need to talk I, about it. I think, I think, um, I think cause I, I had that fear in an early age of psychiatrists and, and things and not, and seeing this, like this whole, you know, dark area of like, of, of not understanding what will they do to me? And, and it's not about that. I have seen psychiatrists after post head injury and when I was in a rehabilitation unit and there was a psychiatrist there. I had loads of different forms of um, therapy there. And it's fantastic. It was my real introduction to therapy. And it's from that, I, I realized the, the benefit of this. But so a psychiatrist there and it was really interesting talking to him and why he was doing. So it was like the psychology of like understanding what is making that particular person tick. Because everything we talk about is so individual to the individual person. People might people might um, empathise or or actually have, feel a connection with some of the things that I'm saying and some of the things that you're saying. But ultimately, it is their individual thing. The, the psychologist yeah. and uh, psychiatrist is working out what those um, what those pathways and what those indicators act, actually mean. Um, yeah, so I guess l let me just jump in on the on that yeah. kind of counselling sort of therapy psychiatry. They've kind of got these different terms, and I I presume they do actually have different kind of levels. But in terms of um, the, you know the tools that we can start to kind of call on if we're if we are becoming aware that we're starting to struggle with our own mental health or with our own psychology, um, we've kind of talked about mindfulness, um, and but we've talked about just communicating with people, just getting out yeah. into nature 
but also just communicating, just talking to some mm. of these people. And it's been a real privilege, privilege for me, um, <laughs> can't say the word, to, um, to be able to just continue to have conversations with people across the industry. Yeah. Um, but actually... Yeah. Everyone needs to be doing that right now. People need to be reaching out. They need to be talking. But just on the on the counselling thing, like if people do feel like they need to go a little bit further, um, yeah, you know, what's what's your experience of like? How did you know when you needed to go and and you know do some group therapy or needed to go and seek a counsellor? I mean, it sounds like you've been um, you've sort of met with different types. Like just sort of briefly, mm. how have how have you found that? How do you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's a really good question, and something just just that you just made me think of there is that um, is that you know let's not forget that not everybody you know everybody that knows me knows that uh, I can talk the hind legs off a donkey. But um, that <laughs> we have gone cool. longer today than that's some cool. of my other interviews, that's for sure. <laughs> but it's so <laughs> important, I think, to talk um, about this. So I, I really am that, thankful that, to that you. That in for itself, this. sorry, um, that that in itself is is a is a. Uh, a, a personal um, uh, fit sense of achievement because after being knocked over, I found it really difficult for um, uh, uh, about eighteen months to two years to actually a bit longer actually to actually structure sentences again. So actually doing wow. doing that is is quite a thing. But and that makes me think that you know we mustn't forget that um, uh, the people where their natural inclination, their natural comfort, is to not be necessarily voluble. And and we shouldn't try and force people to do that. It's a really soft, gentle, gentle area. Some people are happy in their own, you know, in their own being and, and aren't particularly talkative. It's it's not forcing things on people, basically. Uh, the app that you mentioned, fantastic. So where where do you where do we uh when do we decide? Um personal experience like uh, deciding to go for mindfulness group therapy um was uh was just felt like a natural feeling because I knew my, knew myself so well then, and I understand my my clinical depression as much as yeah. I can uh, at that point. So it it felt like I need this. I need something. I need to step outside. I need to step out and actually get something. The, the point of counselling of seeking counselling is, I think, in a nutshell, like if uh, if you're in a good relationship, a talkative relationship, is if you're feeling. Again, I'm not a professional. This is just purely my strong feeling about this. If you're feeling that in that relationship that you you feel that I, I can't talk to my my partner at the moment because I don't want to burden them or it, it's going to ruin, I won't be able to sit comfortably with them in the evening having offloaded what, what I'm going through and worrying and as a person that worries about uh, or is concerned about what other people feel and, and making sure they feel comfortable with that it happens a lot in my head is so, so where can I then take that? And with counseling and the, I've got some, um, uh, some links, which I'll post up on my Facebook uh, page and I'll, I'll look at whether we can do it on lefts as well. Um, is, uh, is the, you're taking what you feel you need to let go of and what you feel you need to speak about, um, uh, in an environment where you don't have um, you don't have an emotional contract with this person, you're not going to be sitting with them in the evening and watching television or having dinner with them. Mm. Um, at the moment, it's very difficult, of course, if you're not already in a, uh, a relationship with the counsellor because you've got to do it online. Um, mm. and, and there are a lot of counselling. I did uh, a bit more research on this before before doing this. There's uh, a couple of um, uh, places where I can uh, point people in the direction to where they will recommend a counsellor in your area in, a, in, a, in what you think is the form of counselling that might work for you, um, and they will do it online. Disadvantage with that, of course, and I know I've spoken with people that are having counselling online at the moment, is that it, it's not quite the same thing because there's not the face-to-face one-on-one contact is not that energy that as humans we feel um and you're not in a neutral space you're potentially still in your own home but it's about making sure if you're doing that in being in a space where you won't be interrupted where you can be completely quiet uh and where you just decide in your mind um to to let that space go for for this for what you want to do so the yeah, yeah, different yeah. forms of counselling, I mean, I could reel them off to behavioural therapy, um, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, which sounds like, ah, what on earth is that? Somebody's going to mess with my mind. It's not. I've, I've had that. I had mindfulness 
CBT, so Mindfulness Cognitive Behaviour Therapy, which is about, um, in, the, in the cases of depression, it could work in anxiety as well, but, um, uh, but particularly in depression because it's usually a, something that you're, you're, you're really locked into a way of thinking. It's about rethinking, retraining your brain to think in a different way. Um, and then patting yourself on the back for doing that because you're in charge of it. You're not having drugs for that. Nobody's, nobody's, um, it's not psychoanalysis, which some people find psychoanalysis works really well for them. You're analyzed and then given advice and a, and a process to go through. Um, it, it, it is about retraining your brain in doing it. If you think about it, yeah, yeah, yeah. We do that a lot in everyday life. In how we think about things, I'm sure if you if you're doing something on CAD that's not you know that's annoying you in the process yeah. that you're doing, for instance, then it's like okay, sit back. What's what's going wrong with this? What is it? What about if I approach it this way? Ah, mm. Hallelujah! <laughs> and it's the it, it it's that kind, same kind of thing. Yeah. Obviously, I'm yeah, simplifying, yeah. simplifying this. No, but I want for sure. I think. Yeah, I think that I Go think ahead. the encouragement is to is to seek seek it out, like you know. And it's really interesting yeah. hearing what you're saying about the not having an emotional contract or an emotional link with 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 someone, and the fact that you you can kind of free yourself up, and the fact that yeah. freeing yourself up just to talk about this stuff, which is kind of yeah. part of what we're saying here, um, is is in itself a kind of a freeing experience um so yeah th th you know uh, we kind of need to wrap this up but like thank you very <laughs> very much like all i can say That's is thank okay. you so much like it's been an absolute privilege to to kind of talk about this with you um and just to touch on on some of these some of these subjects because it um you know it's something that i yeah i came into this totally terrified to know oh, about how to you. talk about this properly well, um, thank you and I think the the reality is that right now there's an awful lot of people out there that are going through something new. Um, they might mm. not be struggling mm. with it. They might feel absolutely fine, or they could be in a totally different way through this cycle. But um, there there will be something in people's psychology that is changing, and they probably do need to be talking about that. Um, you know, with someone or other, just to uh, just to get the support that they need. Um, mm. So yeah, just it, sort of in conclusion, like is there is there anything else that um, that you want to share or any kind of message for for our um for our amazing industry um just um, by way of closing. I, I think um I, I think when 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 we go back to whatever we go back to um uh, i i hope i like to think that um that perhaps you know there's parts of the business that are stuck in the way that we do things on the long hours and things and, and everything but um mm -hmm. i think we are seeing changes in that and I think we should embrace it and try and encourage it. It's difficult because you know what it's like. If if I say something or complain about something, will I ever get to work again for that company? Uh, it's difficult, but I think I think we can start to to um, to work on that. And it's uh, be kind, be empathetic, and um, be considerate. We're we're such a, a, a crazy wonderful group of people that go in and do these things and do this mm. do this work that we do um you know i'm as nervous as the next person about how on earth are, are stage managers going to be needed on on um uh on remote uh, conferences and um, uh, no, they are even more so i would say chasing people around their homes and getting them comfortable on camera when they've got a whole personal world sitting right in the next room yeah which is what Lisa said on that other talk yeah. the other week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Which exactly. was that was that was like music. Yeah, that was yeah, music to my ears. Actually, I remember now. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, so there, you know, that's a, a talking thing. You've just eased my mind on just saying that, and <laughs> and it's cool. uh, it's as you know, it's as simple as that. Keep talking, keep Brilliant. listening, and there are on Facebook. There's a group called uh, the Cowshed, which was set up by um, a friend of mine in Ireland who uh, suffers with um, uh, clinical mental health issues. And he set it up as a place where people can just go and just look at how p other people are feeling. It's just that whole thing about realising that you're not alone. Other people do feel and have similar feelings to what you're feeling. If you're feeling down, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling full of anxiety, other people do feel that. And the cash shed can be a great place to do that. I'll put all these up on my Facebook page. And um, there are some other interviews that have been conducted through uh, another radio station, online radio station called Ancrew.live, which has been set up by a, a rigger and another guy from the business. And it plays music. Mm -hmm. They also have interviews. 
So those interviews are recorded and I'm working at the moment of uh, just thinking about whether or not through that group um, I can find a way of interviewing therapists from the different forms of therapy um, to actually ask them about what that's like. Because anything, if you feel that you might be edging towards needing therapy, try and do your research early. Do it now, even if you're feeling okay. Have a look at what these therapies are and try and, while you're clear-minded, uh, or as clear as you can be, try and um, pinpoint something that interests you or you think you might connect with because it will save you time and a lot, a lot of uh, uh, brain um, ache and problems um, later. So, yes, so take care. and um, Amazing. And keep, well, thank keep you. getting the sun shining when we can. Serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. What a privilege it's been um, to talk with you uh, on this subject. So, uh, thank you so much, thank Lammy. You. Um, thank you and again. Thank you, Dave. I think stay stay. brilliant. Brilliant what you're doing. Well done. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.